You're listening to the MindPod Network. Hello, friends. We're closing in on episode 100 of the It's All Happening podcast, and now is the time when I really need your support. Please, I know there are so many things out there in the multiverse that require your charity and your goodwill and your friendship, but maybe this podcast can be one of them now and then. Head on over to uh, my site, ZachLeary.com, and use the Amazon portal or uh, you know buy a T-shirt or you could just make a donation uh, via PayPal or whatever you want to do. But uh, bringing you content week in and week out is hard work, and we really need your support. So please head on over, ZachLeary.com. I love you. Thank you. It's all happening. 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 Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the podcast, episode 97 of the It's All Happening with Zach Leary podcast. That's me, your host. Very exciting. So we're closing in on episode 100 here. This week we have uh, Jason Rotman, who is our guest. We'll talk about more more about him in a second. He's a, um, let's, say, let's say he's a bhakti-infused financial wizard. Yes. He is shrouded in wizardry and sorcery but with a bhakti heart well i'm really kidding but that that's what he is but we'll talk about more about him in a second but first let's talk about that topic that you're probably so tired of hearing about but we're going to talk about it just for a second health care when the affordable care act otherwise known as obamacare uh was drafted and then um, put into committee and then eventually passed into law in 2009 through 2010. Uh, the process that that, that entailed, um, first of all, Obama's White House was driven by Rahm Emanuel, who was the chief of staff and one of the primary architects and authors of the ACA, was Rahm's brother, Zeke Emanuel, uh, out of Chicago, who's one of the uh, sort of most powerful uh, and outspoken medical experts and surgeons uh, in, in, in the United States. And he knew enough about the system as it relates to patient, doctor, Medicaid, private pay, and hospitals and all the different layered nuances of that. So he was, uh, was a, 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 a primary force in that. And of course, his brother was running the White House. So it really was a very, very handy thing. So say what you want about Obamacare. It was an incredibly well uh, drafted and well researched uh, bill that's just pages and pages and pages of law that has to do with Medicaid expansion, and Medicare savings, and taxes, and uh, dependent health insurance, and the employer mandate, and delivery system reforms, and of course the subsidy tables and tiers, and how that all worked to depending on your on your level of income and where that would kick in. And of course, the open marketplaces that you found online, the exchanges to basically compare and uh, contrast the different plans that work for you. Of course, there were negative things about it that uh, we, we can't get into. But the point is, it was incredibly well dialed in. Although at the very beginning, you remember all those websites weren't working and stuff. That wasn't very good. But that aside, so what the Republicans did here for the last few weeks is not that. They just threw together something, anything that would just basically further the Republican agenda, which is one, dismantling any form of Barack Obama's legacy because they could not stand the black guy having uh, a little, uh, you know, six, a little gold star next to one piece of legislation that still has his name on it. 
and two uh, further other parts of the of the GOP uh, agenda, which is tax cuts for the rich, which was the first bill was really based on that. It was a gigantic tax cut um, disguised and weaved into various health care provisions that didn't pass. So then they just went on the repeal thing. And thank God there's still some common sense that uh, you cannot just repeal something and leave 20 million people without health insurance without giving them another option. That that just doesn't make any sense. And somehow, for whatever reason, it always goes back to this. Those people that are affected most by who would have been affected most by this bill are the people who are voted Republican in the first place. The poorest, most rural uh, states that use the most per capita um, uh, use of Medicare and Medicaid are the reddest states. And somehow they're wrapped up in this thinking that these people, uh, these people being the GOP, have their best interests in mind. So it's one of the great scandals of all modern history that somehow the Republican Party could use social sound bites and to con uh, these, these uh, low income people, rural people, into voting for them and taking away their health care. It didn't pass, but whew, what uh, a spectacular theater this has been to watch. So this week's podcast is with Jason Rotman, who's a really cool guy. He has a book out called 72 Messages of Love, which is a beautiful book on poetry inspired by uh, love and sort of the bhakti path. Um, but I wanted him on the program because, yes, he's a bhakta and, and sings kirtan and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's very, very cool. But by daytime, he's uh, by day, he's also uh, a, a, fi a financial wizard and deals with uh, with with trading and, and commodities and uh, various complex systems of of the open markets. And sometimes you can find him being an analyst on the TV, on CNBC and stuff. And I thought it was just a great sort of uh, – you know, dichotomy just to, to wrestle with that he can exist in both worlds, that they don't have to be mutually exclusive, that somehow there could be conscious capitalism out there, that that is a real thing. And uh, conscious capitalism infused with bhakti and yoga and love and that one doesn't have to uh, exist without the other. So he's a great guy who's living in the material world, but also expressing his heart um, in the material world as well and doesn't see them as separate. So that's why I wanted him on the podcast and his, uh, his, uh, Kirtan group is called Krishna's Kirtan and it's on iTunes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he plays a Bhakti fest. So, uh, Jason Rotman, enjoy the podcast. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming. It is absolutely my pleasure. It's a long time coming. It I'm is a long time. Very happy to be in your in your home. Oh, thank you. Yes, you're at the the kitchen table. Nice, <laughs> as it's referred to on the show, the the kitchen table. And I'm so glad we got to do it in person. Uh, yeah, man. So yeah, thanks for coming. I've been. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Well, I never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I did want to sort of. So start off with, you know, I've been wanting you to come on the podcast because you occupy, at least in my eyes, from the outside, a very interesting place in the world. Uh, you know, I know you through the Bhakti Yoga community and and uh, you sing Kirtan and you have a love of Krishna and as do I. But yet, now and then I'll see a video of you talking on CNBC, mm -hmm. all sorts of interesting shit. Um, and, you know, and I love how those two worlds could kind of coexist. So... You know, generally where, where I wanted to start and it's kind of a, a place to jump off. It's like, how do you take um, 
and this is the classic Bhagavad Gita stuff about mm-hmm. taking devotion into everything you do. But how do you take this sort of you know sweet sort of space that you hang out in in your bhakti heart and kind of exist in a in a world, a finance you know economy driven world that is very very you know fast paced and some might say cutthroat, ruthless, um, not necessarily heart centered. <laughs> You know, greed is good. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Just the general kind of generic perception. Mm-hmm. So how do you... Oh, the you, generic perception, right. How do you mix the worlds? I mean, for me, you know, um, it kind of started with a breakdown of a prior situation. You know, I was living in Chicago in 2000. I graduated from college in 2001, moved to Chicago in 2002, left there in 2006. That's kind of mm-hmm. something I could start with. And then leaving Chicago, getting out of a relationship... I was trading at the time. So I've had three, four years of experience before I left Chicago. So I was in that trading finance world where I saw people making tons of money, like young people. And I'm like, this is insane. You know, it's like, it was like being behind a certain curtain, you know? Right. Um, Like, oh, this is how they do it. Like no idea that that existed. Um, And leaving that, prior structure that I was in with the relationship, um, with even living in my home city. Cause I'm from Chicago more or less Okay, like that was kind of an opening. So there was a whole opening in my life that happened where I felt as free as ever actually to, to seek, to travel, to open up, to inquire. Hmm. And like Jesus said, <laughs> I'm not comparing myself to him, but the principle of like, seek, you know, seek, seek God first, seek the kingdom of heaven first. Yes. And then everything else will be added to you. That was kind of my period right there. So other people could come at things differently or come at God or spirituality differently. Obviously everybody comes at it their own way, sure. but that was my way of like leaving, leaving, leaving a structure that was disintegrating. And before just jumping right into the next structure, like letting it emerge through through the seeking and through the traveling. I went on this road trip, you know, for two months, Colorado, New Mexico. I met these amazing spiritualists in New Mexico that changed my world. Wow. Um, <clears throat> San Francisco. And, and it's just like I met these amazing people and it was my own jolly journey. You know, it was my own open ended journey. And during that <clears throat> during that journey, did it did it make you question what it is you were doing or did it just change the relationship? To- <sighs> Well, it was, it was a full on seeking. I mean, it was a full on seeking. Like, I I mean, as far as question what I was doing, like I knew what I was doing. Yeah. I never didn't know. I I never didn't not know. Right. (laughs) Okay. Fair enough. Um, it was just a whole, it was a whole set of experiences looking back that were just undeniably, undeniably and utterly formative. I mean, I could tell so many stories about the people I've met. Yeah. So what was the Jason like before that? First pilgrimage and the Jason like after. Um, what were the big differences? <clears throat> well, there was a, uh, I mean, of course, there's a, one underlying thread of it all, which is me yeah. and my soul. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but there was kind of like a college, you know, experience, uh, which, mm-hmm. and then there was the post college experience of that four to five years, which was a little bit different than the college experience. And then, mm-hmm. and then after I, maybe was less seeking and more have found, you know, then there was that experience, which is still happening. Um, you know, college, I played football in college. I played sports in high school. You played football in college. I did. I did. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I went to Princeton. I played football at Princeton. I was a defensive lineman. I was about 40 pounds heavier than I am now. Okay. Um, well, that's, uh, that's, that's something. Yeah, that's yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> so I made amazing friends there. I'm, I'm uh. still in close touch with them. They're wonderful people. And, uh, I guess with all that said, not, not, but anything like I was, you know, I, I, I did a lot of drinking and I was like, I didn't quite like, for example, like a perfect example is like Princeton is known for these acapella groups. Like, sure. The, of course. Like yeah. tons of acapella groups. And it's like, if I had to go back, yeah. like I would be in an acapella group, but it's like in my mind, I'm like, Oh, football, acapella, like, eh, I have a little bit of a, <laughs> a, a little bit of a reverence for them. Cause I dated someone who went to, uh, who went to Yale and the Yale whiff and poofs. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can know a little bit about yeah, it. It's yeah. strangely kind of awesome, by the way. Oh, yeah, big time. No, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So it's like yeah. I was still, I mean, I don't know, if, I mean, struggling for lack of a better word with like combining those two worlds of like pure art and pure heart hmm. with football. 
And that was my dichotomy, like the art and the heart versus football. Like I was kind of going through that where it's like I had the best time in college. But at the same time, like looking back, I wish I would have done the singing. Like I wish I would have done plays and stuff like that. It was a great experience, but that was my dichotomy in my mind, you know. Okay. Um, and then after that, I really started to seek after college, reading books. Like I remember mm-hmm. um, in college just seeking and f- finding out all this stuff online. I saw a picture of Prabhupada. I saw this term Krishna consciousness when I was reading about yoga and stuff. Mm. And I was reading these articles where like either Prabhupada himself or it was a transcribed lecture or something. But I remember this principle reading about it online 20 years ago where it's like, you know, the people in Krishna consciousness, like the goal is just to focus on Krishna 24 hours a day. And it was, it just seemed very out there. It just seemed very like I, I couldn't even relate. Yeah. And then gradually I started to relate more. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know exactly what you mean. I, I first got, uh, so I guess I could say introduced to what Krishna conscious was. Krishna consciousness was when I was a teenager in high school because I had a friend I mean, he wasn't a super close friend, but he was kind of in our community who was uh, just a pally surfer kid who uh, became a, a full on, you know, Krishna brahmacharya and, you know, dropped out and gave his surfboards and all this stuff to everyone. And I just was like, Oh my God, what is he doing? Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it was my first exposure to it. And I thought it was fascinating but I didn't have sort of the, I guess, probably the discipline, you know, to really kind of internalize that and put it into practice at that time. For sure. I had to go off on many, many different tangents before I could apply that. Do you feel it was the same for you? Do you sort of first heard about it or were you, when you first heard about it, were you ready just to dive in? No, I'll, I'll tell you exactly a couple things. Yeah. Um, as far as answering that question, um, the first major just visceral experience I had with Krishna um, was I was living in Chicago in my one bedroom apartment. um, And I uh, met a friend named Nick and Nick was very deep into spirituality and and meditation. And he was a clairvoyant. He would read my energy and like that was a whole other universe of, of being that I never even knew existed. He could see the energy. He could see the lines. He could see, it was amazing. And, um, Oh, beyond. And, um, and he was telling me about like Bhagavan Das and Krishna Das. And that was the first time I've ever heard of these people. And that was the days of Napster. If you recall, of course, very, very well. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was searching for Bhagavan Das and it turns out that I randomly or unbeknownst to me downloaded a Krishna Das song. Never heard of the guy. And it turned out to be the Maha Mantra Meltdown, which is now like my top five ever, you know? <laughs> and I heard this Maha Mantra Meltdown and I'm telling you, Zach, like that was life changing. Uh-huh. That was my, one of my first, if not my first bhakti, visceral, uh, can't deny amazing. it, life changing cool. experience. I heard the Maha Mantra Meltdown, Krishna Das singing. I was standing in my apartment and I, I was just like, it was like you were like on drugs. You're like, whoa, <laughs> like what is this? And it was just like the words I could use is like uh-huh. it literally opened up this sacred ancient yogi cave within me. Yeah. That Green Day didn't do. <laughs> that, you know, like Metallica didn't do. That Dave Matthews, you know, I mean, yeah. he's, he's beautiful singing, but like different, way different. And yeah. so that was experience number one. And then, um, the other thing which Krishna talks about as well, like you need, you need a teacher, you know what I mean? Like I, I met a devotee on the streets in Chicago and he handed me this book and we had these wonderful discussions on Krishna. But even like, if you just read the book and I tried to read the Bhagavad Gita by myself, like I kind of couldn't do it, you know? Mm, Interesting. And, but talking to somebody who was living it, you know, that was very, very helpful. Yeah. And then the real immersion when I started to chant every day and go out on the Friday night kirtan parties and like just have a blast was when I started going to the temples every day, the monks would be giving these free Bhagavad Gita classes. I would listen, I would inquire. And these were people that were chanting for two hours a day for 20 years. And they were fully devoted to sharing Krishna consciousness. And it's like, my point is, is that just like Krishna says, like just simply inquire 
and, and, and serve those who are living the truth. Mm. And then you've got a shot, you know, and then they'll kind of bless you, you know? Yeah. And it is, you know, in all of Bhakti, no matter what path you're in, it is sort of a disciplic, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the disciples sort of the, the passing down, Yeah, you know, because it really is sort of based off of that tradition of just, you know, originally an oral tradition, passing it down and passing it down and passing it down mm-hmm. and, and kind of. And then that mixed with sort of good association, you know, that concept of, you know, especially in the Krishna, you know, the Vaishnav lineage of what good association means and why that is so important Mm -hmm. because you really have to, you know, taste it from someone else, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I was very fortunate to, to be able to be on in, in that association, um, Mm. to hear people sing from their soul and heart and be able to sing with them, to hear people teach about the spiritual, you know, truths of, of, of the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. Yeah, it's, it's, it was life changing. So when, with all of this new found consciousness that you had in your life and you, you know, your whole worldview and heart view and soul view changed, how did it affect your perception or outlook on say the, the financial world or did it? I mean, do you look at it? Did you look at it differently or is it just sort of just something that you did? I mean, how, how is it that you view that world? Well, the thing is, is that because it's very unique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. but you know, at the same time, man, mm-hmm. like I remember at least ten years ago, um, reading about this guy. I think his name was like Jeff Kessler, maybe totally different. But the point is, is that there was this guy. Mm-hmm. How I landed upon the article, who knows, right? Mm-hmm. In in the world of the internet, um, but there was this guy who was like ultra successful, you know, currency trader or something. And he devoted his whole life to like Sanskrit and sh- and, you know, funding, you know, oh. whatever, you know what I mean? And I'm like, and I read about that 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And I'm like, huh? Like, you know, you, you see things and they're kind of, some of this stuff just stays with you. Like, yeah, sure. well, that's interesting. And so I knew it was possible. Um, but at the same time I stopped trading for a while and I met Pia and we started to go full on like grassroots hippie heart business, like raw food. You know, we were setting up farmer's markets, selling raw food. We were making raw food. Oh, really? Bring it to people. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, How big cool. Time. I didn't know that. Okay. Oh yeah. For two years, that was our full on income. That was our full on life. Hosting raw food potlucks. Raw foodists. Raw food. Oh, I didn't we, know that. We were okay. raw foodists. Hey, yeah. PM more or less is, and I, you know, huh. I'm not anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I, you know, as far as answering that question, like yeah. once I started to do the whole, Bhakti, Krishna, devotion, like really, really embrace more of my soul with the benefit of the lifestyle and the teachings and, and, and the people that started to, to, to take over. So it's like that, yeah. <clears throat> that led Pia and I into that, into that path. And then I got back into trading by choice. Truthfully, Pia became pregnant with Solana, who's now six. And I had a couple great years trading in Chicago. So I got, I mean, like I call it like when you have great years trading, like I call it the magic carpet, like you're on a magic carpet. Like that's just the bottom line, like to be able to make money trading and set your own hours and not have to answer to anybody and be able to, because ultimately trading is a skill. It's like you're a carpenter. Like it's not luck. Right. It's a craft. Right. Trading is a craft. Yes. And when you have mastered that or even close and you could do that consistently, like you're literally on a magic carpet. So I experienced that magic carpet stuff. So when Pia got pregnant, I'm like, you know what? I want to see if I could hop on again. So I got back into or I moved forward into trading and I've been in that industry for the past. Well, I've been in since the raw food break. It's been, you know, six, seven years. Wow. I mean, and not to, you know, get too esoteric, but there's something, and you talked about the magic carpet, which is, it's it's a great metaphor, but you know, I find there's something so fascinating about, um, about that world. And it really, it, it, it sort of, it got illuminated for me when I watched, um, inside job, which is sadly about, you know, the 2008, the scandal and the breakdown, but, um, about like credit default swaps and derivatives and how like this model got so complicated that no one understood it. Yeah. You know, it just, it, it got beyond the point of comprehension that they didn't even really know how all of this was working, but somehow it was. Right. And then they could sort of exploit it a little bit. But 
forget all the nefarious stuff aside and subprime mortgages and screwing people. I don't, I mean, don't mean any of that, but there's something fascinating about this world that's been created that is sort of like this magic carpet. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's, um, you know. I mean, we were talking before we went on the air about like the dark ages and the age of enlightenment. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's related to that in a sense of it's, it's from a different, like the whole financial world is from a, a, a different part of the collective consciousness than mm. the physical acts of hunting and gathering, right? It's, yes. it's, a, it's from a totally different place. That's, that's it's from right. a very mental place. It's from a yes. very different part of the brain even. You know what I mean? You're not just focused on what's in front of you. You're not focused on just what your hands are doing and to try to get something. It's a whole mental thing. Like you're mm. planning, you're, and it's like, but at the same time, it's 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 still rational in a sense. Like it's it's all these moving parts do have their purpose. Yeah, they have their purpose. Like <clears throat> like, mm. um, let me just collect my thoughts for a moment. Like all like for example, Warren Buffett, which is like he called derivatives like the ticking time bomb because that's what all these things are. There there's there's this there's there's something. And then there's a derivative of something that you can trade. And then there's the derivative of that derivative. And it's kind of like a rabbit hole, which is what you're referring <laughs> right, to. Yes, it's like the exactly, rabbit hole. Yes. Um, and it's, it's um, you know, could it be any other way? Yes. But at the same time, like it kind of is what it is. And, and it's up to all of us to share as, to shed as much light on everything as mm. we can. Right. So, you know, this is, is a, this next question isn't like a, you know, it's not a judgment on my, myself or you or the systems or anything like that. But as we forge, you know, into the 21st century and we look around, um, uh, you know, especially with the political climate being what it is, and we do see that um, the disparity, the wealth disparity in America has grown. The wealth gap has grown more in the last 30 years than it has in the previous 200 years. Um, you know, the top 1% owns 90%, whatever, mm -hmm. for whatever reason that happened, that's not important. But what it has happened is that, you know, people who are, um, you know, capitalists like you or me, I, get, I do feel like there's a little bit of like this disconnect in the, sh in the way that like, oh shit, what are we going to do? I mean, there are so many people who really like, you know what can they do? You know, how mm -hmm. can we offer them a solution? Yeah. You know? So yeah. What, 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 well, what do you make of that? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind and I'm going to defer mm. to, uh, in a sense to Mark Zuckerberg, because mm. if you're familiar with his kind of philosophy is that he's been talking more about a, a basic income for everybody. Yeah. Elon and this Musk is too. Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah exactly. Universal so it's like, income, yeah. what if those two things, capitalism and that are, are not at the polar opposites, you yeah. know? What if they start out at the polar opposites, but then um, in the infinite loop fashion, like what if they meet, you know what I mean? Like what if they meet and something becomes even better than what if they were just opposites, you know? Hmm. And so as far as I go, oh, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so as far as I go, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that, and this is basic out of like a textbook, but I do firmly believe it that like, ver you know, socialism, communism, uh, a monarchy, uh, you know, whatever, like capitalism in its highest form, it's like, it enables creativity. It, it encourages, I should say creativity. It encourages being your best. It encourages working on yourself for its own sake, but also because there's an infinite reward pool out there. The more yeah. value, like Tony Robbins, mm. like mm. you want to earn more money, like you add more value, you know, yeah. that's like the integrity that's that's the way to live in the capitalism world with integrity like you add value to the to the world you don't just rely on a government to give you a thousand bucks a month yeah and then that's your life right so that's the best way to be in the world of capitalism is to is to add as much value as you can and if and if you can be intelligent if you want to to try to figure out ways to monetize that which we all have to do to one degree or another yeah that's what it is. Yeah, and and I agree with that. I, I do, and uh, and and I love that. I'm inspired by that as well. But at the same time, I'm also like you know, in the sense that uh, you know, there's kind of like the, the Buddhist koan that the world also needs ditch diggers. Not everybody is hardwired to exist in that sort of platform. Yeah, you know, I do think that there are people who may be hardwired. You know, they're 
they get the thousand dollars a month from the government and because for whatever reason mm -hmm. and that's okay because i do think that, that there is enough to go around but um yeah i mean it and it's an amazing climate i mean the zuckerberg story alone i mean my god i watched you know i mean like so many of us but i i watched that from day one mm -hmm. you know i was <clears throat> I was working when I was in the advertising business and I was working at an ad agency and we were, um, one of our projects that was in my group was we designed the Apple student group on Facebook when Facebook was still closed for students. So it's mm. early, early, early days of Facebook. And when it was still closed, not open to the public. And we just remember just watching it, you know, like yeah. Zuckerberg was on email chains with us. Mm. And it was 25 people, right? you know, with nothing. And just, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's just insane how, how that can happen. And you when know, I was in, thing. when I was in college or Princeton, like, um, in, in high school, it was called like the yearbook, right? Yeah. But at Princeton, right. we, we got these physical books with pictures of all the different people in the different classes. And that was called Facebook. Like, hey, did you get the Facebook? The yet? Facebook, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but that's the power, you know. Of course, Steve Jobs is a great example. Elon Musk. It's like that stuff doesn't happen in a non-capitalistic society. It I mean, can't. It can't. Look at North yep. Korea. Like, where's yeah. Steve Jobs? There, like he's being squashed. You yeah. Know? I mean, the amazing thing is that you create this fertile soil of innovation. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, and the universal basic income thing is also fascinating because you know this is a statistic, mm -hmm. and we talked about this on a recent podcast too. But this statistic comes from the Department of Labor. It's not even a fringe stat that 60% of all children who are in elementary school today will work in a job that has yet to be invented. Yeah. 60%. I, I can believe that. that. It's so crazy. And that's why the universal basic income thing is probably going to be more and more and more important because so many of these things that we considered the backbone of America mm -hmm. don't exist anymore, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or won't exist anymore. And that's going to be really, really, really fascinating to watch. So as a parent, what, what do you think? How, how old are your kids? Uh, one and a half, six, and 15. 15? 15. 15. Oh. Makalea. She's, a, she's going into sophomore year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? What's she interested in? She's interested in, um, like, specifically, like, I could see her totally being, like, event planner. Okay. Or something with people. She loves to bake. Um, she's. She, I, she, I'm taking her every day this week to the Groundlings to do improv classes. She loves that. Oh, you're doing that now. Right? I'm doing that yeah. tonight. Actually, I'm taking my own improv class tonight <laughs> at the Groundlings because awesome. that's one of my first loves is stand up comedy. You know, yeah, you were saying that's big awesome. time, big yeah. time first love, and yeah. it, you know, um, so you know those, and it's like she can do whatever she wants with that. I mean, ultimately. And even that kind of ties into like whether it's she's an event planner or whether she's an actor or a, a, an, 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 a comedian or whatever, like there's always going to be, no matter how advanced Watson gets or, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? Like there's always going to be, even from, even from like, if you believe in spirituality, yeah. if you believe in the soul, there's the soul is, is always going to uh, stand tall. You know, the soul is always going to have that unique creative force that a machine cannot replicate. So therefore, you know, there has to be an, uh, an everlasting opportunity for people to contribute versus just be wiped out by machines like Terminator two. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, and even Elon Musk is saying AI is the biggest threat that earth has ever faced, you know? Yeah. Um, and he's smart. So it's like, that's not a, maybe a, that far out of a comment. Yeah. Um, uh, what do we do about that? I'm not exactly sure. Do we, do we just like bottleneck everything and like, you know, you can't do put that. the brakes on? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he, he doesn't even think that. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, so I think there's, there's always going to be opportunities, you know, again, maybe it's like, it's not plowing the field. Like maybe, maybe in the future it'll be 2% plowing the fields versus 500 years ago. It was like 80% as far as the jobs, but yeah, there's going to be ways for people to contribute. Absolutely. And this happens. I mean, it, it's probably happening in, in a little bit more of a, I mean, look at esports. Esports is an economy. You know what I mean? Esports. Um, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Of course. It's yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. esports oh 20 years oh ago. My are God. you kidding? Can you believe it? But like, that's an economy. Like yeah. you want to talk about the capitalistic system, like existing in people's heads, yeah. which is what it is. Esports is a whole multi-billion, like Amazon bought Twitch for almost a billion dollars. Can you believe what goes on on Twitch every day? Exactly. It's, it's insane. But man. it's like, so <laughs> that, that's kind of like we're, we're in a virtual world yeah. with virtual money in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. But it's like. That's a real world. 
It is absolutely. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the whole sort of foundation of of of, of my work. Is I think that um, uh, the, the the human condition is in fact mutating and kind of an effusion into the digital sort of cybernetic reality, which mm-hmm. is another dimension. And for us to you know why you know human beings have this propensity to think that like you know here we are you know homo sapien like this is the end of the evolutionary line Mm -hmm. there's no way that's not possible there's going to be a human being Mm 2.0 you can be absolutely sure of it just as there was homo erectus and cro magnon and neanderthal before that there's going to be a next version of us Mm -hmm. this is not the end of the evolutionary line and what that is I don't know. I think it's a fusion with some sort of, you know, silicon cybernetic dimensional reality. Mm-hmm. And when we see with these things like Twitch, oh my God, mm-hmm. it's insane. I was on some podcast that was, uh, it broadcasts on Twitch and I didn't really know how popular that was. And then it was like being streamed on Twitch and I just, it was insane mm-hmm. what these people are doing, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. doing, doing all day long. Um, but does your, wow. So you have a 15 year old. So does she, um, what's her relationship with, with media? Um, she uses it. She has whole Snapchat dialogues all day, every day with her friends. Like, for okay. example, she she met 15 new people at her improv class yesterday. Mm. Or no, excuse me. She was at like a actually like a Tony Robbins youth leadership thing all week last week. Amazing experience. Super inspired. Changed her whole world as per her, you know, direct feedback. And she's got this whole Snapchat group with her friends now. But my point is, is that like. It's just like it's just another way for people to connect. Yes, also, that's right. It's just it's not I, at its very, very, very best. That's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's a way to bring people into connection and cr- share in a very, very creative way. You yeah. know, which I, I love to do. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can see that. You're, you're very familiar. Well, even I'm sorry. It's like Snapchat, like the Happily Jason Instagram stuff. Like oh, yeah. you, using the filters, like that's fun. You know, good, you, you're good at that. Yeah. It's just pure fun. It's pure yeah. fun. And then the poetry book, which you pointed to, like that's. Yeah. Could a machine write that stuff? Like maybe in its own way, but not in that way. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And I'm not saying that from an egotistical way, but almost just like a fact. Like I don't, I, you know, if there's something could about- a machine write Shakespeare, like yeah. maybe in a little bit of different way, but there's something, my point is, is that there's always, always, always going to be something irreplaceable and, and non replicable. Yes. About the spirit, about the soul. About the heart and the soul. Yeah. Yes. You cannot program the soul. Yeah. Right. Like I don't think uh I don't think Watson would be a very good Kirtan Walla. Yeah. I yeah. mean I'm sure he could learn the ragas really, really easily and mm-hmm. learn Indian classical music, but could not be a really good Kirtan Walla. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. He, I, I'm not so sure. I wonder what he would say. <laughs> or if it's a he. <laughs> it, it, they, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> he would be like, well, play me some chance. I'll learn them. Come back in a year, right? Yeah. 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 But there's, there's, yeah, heart space cannot be, you know, it cannot be programmed really. I, I don't think. Hmm. But so, um, yeah, o- over the course of time and as, you know, as, as a human being and, um, you know, and being a bhakta, you know, I certainly find that your relationship with Bhakti, you know, it grows and it, mm-hmm. it expands and, you know, it changes. It's not what it was in that first, you know, two month trip that you did in Colorado mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and cover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's your, what's your relationship now? Do you think to, to Bhakti? I mean, how do you view it every day? Does it just like, you know, do you just sort of chant mantras and you just, and that just makes you feel good or, yeah, do you, or yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you think? Um, uh, yes, uh, mm. you, you kind of nailed it. Mm. Part of it, you know, it's like I'm I'm kind of like singing all the time. You are, cool. yeah, I like it. Which is what I was doing pre Krishna. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> You're just I was singing different music. Yeah, singing different music, <laughs> and too, it's just yeah. like that Hari Krishna mantra. It's just there's just something, you know. I'm just I'm singing it a lot, you know, driving, walking, like in the house, and like my kids are like, okay, you know. I'm like, no, like I'm not gonna stop. You know, because this could be the last day. This could be the last minute. Like, you never know. You know what I mean? So why not just sing Hare Krishna? Like, not because not you're supposed to, you right. know? Like, I remember, um, brief anecdote, just to illustrate a point. Like, one of the monks that lived in the San Diego Temple, um, he... Oh, is that where you got started in San Diego? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, um, Guru Krishnadas? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I know him a little bit. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. 
um, his son in law from Davins, like one of the best Smurdunga players ever. And right. yeah, right. but my point is that so this monk came back from you know s- chanting on the streets or whatever, and I said something like I was all formal, and I'm like, yeah, you know, Chaitanya says that this is what we should be doing every day, and this <laughs> and that. He, and he literally said from his heart, he was kind of a quirky guy anyway, like as far as just how he spoke. And he, I mean, he's an amazing person, book distributing thousands of books all over the world. And that's what he devoted his whole life to and still is. But he's like, he's like, I would do it anyway. You know, it's just the, 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 the hmm. taste that I get, like I would do it anyway, no matter what anybody says, you know, once you, once you get that taste of, of the Hare Krishna mantra, you just, you just start to do it. Yeah. And maybe you'll do it two lifetimes from now. Maybe you'll do it now. But what Prabhupada says, like, it's a seed, you know, Prabhupada says that every book, you know, every Krishna book in somebody's house is like, is like a time bomb, but in a good way, it's going to go off at some point. Like somebody's going to explode into Krishna consciousness. Right. Right. Um, if, if it's not today, if it's not today. Right. Yeah. So it's like, if, mm. if you're, if you're open and if you're, and if you're, and if some people who even mm. aren't open, get open, but it's like, there's just something about chanting and singing and people relate to God in different ways. You know, it's like. It's, it's there's a whole philosophy. It's like you know the Christian consciousness philosophy is like some people relate to God as a lover, Rod and Krishna, conjugal course, yeah. lover. You're making love with God. Yeah. Uh, some people refer to God as as a father. You know, like for example, Jesus talked about my Father in heaven. You know. Yeah. Um, my Father who art in heaven. Yes. Yeah, and how even when I was getting into Krishna, I'm like, well, how is this like? You know, Jesus, hallowed be thy name. Right. He's talking about a name of God. And there's not one name, but there is all these great saints. Sai Baba of Shirdi is somebody else that I'm super into. Yeah, he's great. Jesus Christ, Prabhupada. They're all talking about Neem Kali Baba, of course, like Nam, Japa, like repeat the name of God. Well, yeah. does God have a name? Who says? You know what I mean? Right. But I feel in my experience with Chani Kirtan and the whole thing, like, like Chaitanya says that God, you know, God has infinite number of names, which would only make sense, you know? Yeah. And I feel ultimately it's like, I always remember this quote from Jerry Garcia, actually related to everything in life, but even also to Kirtan mm. and I'll paraphrase, but like Jerry Garcia said something along the lines of like, all anybody needs is a form through which to express their positive energy. You know, we need a form. Yes. And if that form is Krishna or, you know, hallelujah or or painting, you know, it's all about that intention, you know, mm. and then the source is always with us. This pure unconditional love force is pure. As Michael Beckwith says this, you know, love, intelligence, beauty, you know, <laughs> yes. like it's always here. It's always with us. It's a real power. Yes, it it's is. a real power. Um, like one of the poems I have, uh, if I can remember the, 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 the quartet of lines, it's like, there's something about the higher dimensions they pull you up. They mesmerize your attention. That's kind of a line that I wrote yeah. in that book. And it's like, wow, it, it, like it's, it's true. Like they, it's, it becomes mesmerizing. Like what is out there? What is within? Yeah, it does become mesmerizing. But I, I think too, part of it is, um, you know, there was for whatever reason, you know, and I don't think we know, like maybe the complete historical accuracy um, to the T, but there's something about Sanskrit. Like when Sanskrit was created and written and how it um, uh, sort of bases itself off of energy. And now there's thousands of names for God, yes, but, you know, there's different sort of energetic properties of it. And th- and think Sanskrit gets that, you know, and that's why like, you know, the, the, Mah- the Hare Krishna mantra, you know, it has these and this energetic property to it, this energetic resonance to it that to me just it's beyond shape and form and words. It's always changing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all, and it could be, you know, I, I've chanted the Hare Krishna mantra when I've been incredibly sad and despondent. And then it could sort of, you know, take on its form there, mm-hmm. find some healing there. And other times it's incredibly blissful and celebratory and mm-hmm. take on forms there. But it's so interesting how it can just sort of crack through to these, these different little energetic places. Absolutely. And yeah. w- which is life. Yeah, which is life. You exactly. could be saying, yeah. God, life is sometimes like this. Life is sometimes like that. But you're saying the Hare Krishna mantra is like yeah. this and like that. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm also just giving a different perspective. Yeah. Like, that's what makes it so beautiful. It's like it's non-different. It's non-separate. Yeah, it's it's non-separate. <laughs> but but there's something like if you do that in English, yeah. it's not the same. It's mm-hmm. just not. Like if you go, you know, 
Like, yay, God, yay, God, mm-hmm. yay, 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 mm-hmm. yay, God. It's just not the same. <laughs> There's something mm-hmm. about it that's just like these little keys that just, you know, unlock mm-hmm. these amazing, 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 beautiful forms. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, I would, I would honestly say not, uh, I, I I believe that I understand where you're coming from as yep. far as, well, if you say hallelujah or yay God. I mean, at the same time, though, there's a lot of different ways to get to that feeling and yes, emotion. Sir. You know, yes, I mean. Jerry Garcia is my first guru. You yeah. Know? And so, I you know, I still resonate with that incredibly deeply. It's incredibly important to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yes, there are. But the whole, yeah. you know, the whole, you know, the thing that just rocked my whole world about the Krishna consciousness and. You know, it's, it's just that whole, you can have a direct relationship yes, yes. with God. You can yes, you maybe can. not know God fully, you know what I mean? But it's like, you can at least make that effort. You know, you take one step, you get a thousand steps back, you know, it's like. And you could have a dialogue. You could have a dialogue. Yeah. You could listen. And other spiritual traditions say you can hear God too. Like prayer, prayer is talking. Meditation is listening. You know, like there's all these different ways of, of looking at it. But I had a bar mitzvah. I was raised Jewish and. You know, maybe it was me at the time, but I never really like just dove into that as like this, you know, this transformative path, you know, but now I look at it a little bit differently, you know, because Mm -hmm. there are, there is a lot of overlap. Um, King David, you know, make a joyful noise to the Lord, you know, well at the time I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll just say that because like I'm in temple and that's what they're saying, you know, but now it's like, well, that's a real spiritual thing, you know, (laughs) because of the Kirtan experience, you know, it's like, that's what we're all doing. So you sing Kirtan? You're, yeah, you sing kirtan. Me? What's, yeah. I do. Yeah, you do. Um, what, Krishna's kirtan. Krishna's kirtan, That's yeah. Divine Devotion. It's on yeah. iTunes and Spotify. I'm very I'm very grateful and, and honestly proud of it. Um, it's it's amazing. I love it. I found I was blessed to work with JT Thomas, who's the lead keyboardist for Bruce Hornsby. Travels around the world with Bruce playing, and he's very just cool. he's legendary. And yeah. he added all the music, all the engineering, all the producing. I'm just very fortunate to have worked with him. So it's a full-on studio like multi-layered amazing sacred chan album yeah but you still you still have your kirtan group yeah 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 yeah. it's and the kirtan group is is ever changing there's always different people coming through bhakti fest there's different people um beautiful yeah, yeah it's and it's and it's every time that that i do it in a sense it's it just re reconnects me and it just makes me think man like this is like you can't, like you can't have the same experience just reading about it or thinking about it. Just to be a part of it is just a whole different thing. That is very, very true. Were you a musician before? I just like to sing. Okay, I just, I've so always, you've always sung. I've always yeah. sung, and I've always like just innately, naturally uh, had a huge affinity for uh, very passionate singing. Hmm. Um, you know, very, very passionate, big, almost like booming singing where you're just letting it rip, you know? And so those, 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 uh, interests, you know, have kind of dovetailed with, with the whole spirituality, like with the whole direct conscious spirituality of, well, I'm going to let it rip and I'm going to open myself up as much as possible, but I'm going to sing in pure love and gratitude to God. Yes. Yes. That's, that's the exact same, same thing here, man. For, and for me, it was like, it was almost like this, uh, like sometimes I could default to be to, to being a little bit lazy, you know. Like I'm not exactly by hardwired to be the most disciplined person in the world. But then when I found out you can sing your prayers, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, oh wow, I could do that. And you know what? I could do that every day. Yeah, I'm happy because I do it anyway. Yeah, you know, I'm singing and I'm playing anyway, so I can just do that with my prayers. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one yeah. of my favorite singers is is uh, Freddie Mercury. You know, great singer, yeah. booming singer. Yeah. I mean, and of course, just the whole personality and the, it's great. Yeah. You know, didn't shy away from from being a leader of of attention and just being out there. And yeah. but what a voice, obviously. Oh my God, what a presence! Ridiculous, yeah. 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 And so um, his voice, like when I hear that, just like again, just like when you have a spiritual teacher and you, it's just it's just a presence thing. Yes, you see that. Oh, like. It's a presence. It's a yeah. presence thing. Yeah. So it's like hearing a voice of Freddie Mercury, even to be honest, like sometimes, or like Dave Matthews, like Dave Matthews lets it rip and it's pretty amazing. You yeah. know, it's pretty amazing. In um, his prime, it, 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 they were, they were a great <laughs> band. No um, doubt. you know, Bruce yeah. Springsteen land of hope and dreams is one of my top five songs ever. And mm-hmm. it's like, that's powerful, you know? And as I started to sing more Kirtan, like 
I was letting myself rip, which to be honest, I, which I alluded to earlier, like I didn't let myself do that from a pure artistic standpoint during my college days, uh, high school. Like there were so many, like in high school, like I loved acting and, and I limited myself during high school and college years, not like in this deep, heavy way, but more just like, eh, like there was some fear there. Like, do I become, do, am I an actor and doing this acting on stage oh. in front of people? And am I playing football and basketball? O- other people may not have had that dichotomy, but I did. Right. And the Kirtan just blasted all the walls open. Like because of that object of devotion, you know, even though that object is within and everywhere and it's not just mm. something out there sure. because of that object, um, it's like that there, there was no more separation between anything. Like even mm. that I'm doing the, the financial media stuff, CNBC and Fox and Bloomberg. I actually, uh, I was with a friend years ago when I was started to do that a lot. And he just made this offhanded comment, which came from, you know, some inspired intuitive place, but he's just like, it's all because of the Kirtan, Jason. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, you're actually right. You know what I mean? Because that confidence, that, that divine yes. charisma, that energy, it's like, I'm not singing to try to, you know, impress anybody in a sense. I'm more just this, like connecting to spirit, the Holy spirit, all these different traditional names. It's like, that's real. That's powerful. And somebody asked Prabhupada, like, well, you know, uh, show me God. You know, show me, it's like this famous, you know, dialogue. They're like, show me God. You know, if you're some guru, like, I want you to show me God right now. And Prabhupada said something like, well, here's how to do it. You know, you need to live in a way that God notices you. Right. And then let happen what happens, you know, like, you need to, you know, you need to, and, and, you know, there's like Jesus, like faith and, and works, like it's the spirit of it. It's like, yeah, you can do as many works as you can, but if you're not enjoying it along the way. Like Krishna says, bhakti is joyful at every step, yes. every single step, right? because it's the spirit of each moment, the intention of it all. But you have to participate. You have to participate. Yeah, you do. Well, and that's, yeah. that's the Bhagavad Gita yeah. as, as you, uh, right full action. circle. Yeah, yeah ab- exactly. absolutely. And, and I do love that about Prabhupada sort of like the blueprint that he sort of gave to the West. It's like, yes, you can know this, but you do have to contribute. You have to try to please Krishna Mm -hmm. in some sort of shape, way, shape or form. And, you know, there's a very, you know, sort of full on blueprint and 16 rounds a day and all this kind of stuff. But at the very minimum, just do this and this and that. And I love that because that is, you know, it encourages right action. Yeah. You know, if you're just sitting back and just sort of like, yeah, no, impress me, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not, Mm -hmm. that doesn't work that way. You know, you've got to sort of make your energy a little bit sacred, right? Yeah. yeah. And of course there are people who live in caves and they, and they chant, you know, that's all day, every day. That, it is. That's different. Yeah. That, that's a different, uh, a different methodology. To right. Me. It's the same sort of, uh, I think like it's a same amusement park, mm-hmm. different ride. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It, it can get you there, but yeah, that, that's a, that's a different path. You yeah. Know, full on renunciation. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know I mean? I don't think that's my, karma this time around <laughs> i don't think it is for me either yeah. i mean i think ultimately it's being of the world <clears throat> yeah, yeah i mean you know some of my highest moments um are just being with people and 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 being free with people and talking and like i'm gonna go to an improv class tonight like the just the moments of and i'm a social person so maybe other people get high in a different way but yeah just being with people and having fun and sharing and speaking your truths and I love making people laugh. I love just the positive energy of, of people and of, and of interacting with people. And it's like, that's why, I mean, to share the book, to share the music, but not even in the formal ways, just, just being with other people with, with yourself Mm. in a fully open way. That's, that's the beauty of life, you know? And just like the yin and yang, it's like, well, what if you do that all the time and don't have any time to yourself, you know? Right. Well, maybe that gets a little different. Like you need to have the time for yourself. You need to, or at least I do, like I need to tap into that inner inspiration when, when I, when I meditate and just focus on, well, okay, my intuition, like that's mm. why, that's why I started to meditate in the first place was to connect to my intuition. Cause I knew intuitively that I wasn't as connected to my intuition as I needed to be to live my ah, fullest okay. life. Got it. My intuition. And Prabhupada would call it the super soul. Like this, you're, you're, your North Star, your whatever, your guiding force for your life, you know? So what are you getting from the improv class? 
The improv? Well, yeah. I don't know yet. Oh, okay. You just started. <laughs> no, tonight is, 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 it's like a one night workshop. Oh, okay. I see. Tonight. Yeah. 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 Oh, very cool. Um, yeah. But just, it's, it's a, oh man, I'm so, I'm so impressed because I, I, I've been wanting to do it for a while, but yeah. you know, the naturally, the, yeah. You know, all the and stuff. it's just, uh, you know, and it's like when there's just to have fun, you know, just, just to see what comes up. That's improv anyways, to see what comes up and, and to trust yourself and to, yeah, there's a famous book written by Del Close, who was like the grandfather of improv, trained Chris Farley, famous figure in Chicago. Okay. And the book's called Truth and Comedy, that ultimately the best comedy is about truth, you know, but it, but in a funny way. Um, and improv just lets just, you know, improv in my, because I've done stuff in Chicago too, like stand even stand up comedy, like it's a whole different dimension of, of, of a human being is humor. You know, it's yes. a whole academic study. Like, well, humor, what is humor, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's one of my favorite dimensions. But I, it, it's, I was talking about this with someone the other day, I think. Um, oh, yeah, no, it was on last week's podcast. I had a comedian on, on last week's podcast. And, you know, we were kind of going back and forth with the point of, uh, like, mm-hmm. I think... I think comedy being funny is something that's innate. I don't think you learn to be funny. I think you could learn sort of performance skills and how to behave on stage and sort of like what that means to own the stage and body language and sort of delivery perhaps and how to, you know, articulate. But I think being funny, it's like you either are or you aren't. No, I agree. It's, I I think hundred percent agree. It's, um, it's a, it's a personality. It's a personality. It's the energy of a personality is really what it is. Like I remember, um, being at the comedy cellar right. in New York and Colin Quinn. Yeah. Remember yeah. You know, MTV show. Yeah yeah. 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 Um, and Colin Quinn was on the stage and he was just talking about his day. That's it. He wasn't trying to do anything. I'm not even kidding. He was literally saying like, <laughs> he, he was literally talking about his day and it was funny. It right? was just <laughs> beautiful. It was so funny. Like, wow, that guy is so funny, Yeah. but he was just talking. Well, it's the, it's the great Seinfeld thing. It's a show about nothing, <laughs> right? What'd you do today? I got up and went to, yeah. that's a show. There's a show. Yeah. And they're right. Yeah. That was a show. But they, I want to read you, I want to read you a poem that is dedicated to funny. Do it. It's please. actually a quick poem, but Let's it's, it. it's, yeah. it's very much along the lines of what we're talking about. And this is from, this Jason is from Book a book 70. called 72 messages of love. It was released June 12th. It's on Amazon. Okay. People are buying it and people are writing reviews and people are appreciating it. And I'm reading it, uh, uh, when I do kirtans at events, I, I read the book. I have other people read poems, and it's very stimulating and gets people deep. And, and Good. So the, <laughs> this poem is called Funny, and it's exactly about what we're talking about. What is funny? It's not serious. It's funny. Like a funny look or a funny face with a funny thought expressed by the funny face or a funny comment about something that wasn't funny but the person made it funny, like a shaman. Beautiful. Thank <laughs> you. Well, no, I mean, it's so great. And I can see in everything that you do, Jason, um, you know, and t- talking to you now and seeing you sing Kirtan, read these poems and what I've seen from you on the, you know, on the TV when you're analyzing, you know, financial markets and stuff that you have an air of joy to mm-hmm. you yeah. and in everything you do. So I really, really appreciate that. Uh, that book is out now. Kirtan, do you have like a regular Kirtan schedule? It's not regular. We're going to be at Bhakti Fest in two Bakhti months Fest. for okay, sure. Cool. Um, we'll we'll you see know, you there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And they can, you know, if people want to connect with me, they can, there's my email address in the back of the book. You can follow me on Facebook, Jason Rotman, uh, Krishnaskirtan.com. There's music. I would definitely, iTunes and Spotify is a phenomenal way to listen to the music. Divine Devotions, the album name, Krishna's Kirtan is a group name. Um, and yeah, we just do all sorts of fun stuff, you know, lead, lead sacred gatherings, there's just so many ways, you know, there's so many ways. Yes, there are. <laughs> there are so many there's ways. so many ways to connect. And, you know, ultimately, you know, in my experience, it's one of my favorite things. And ultimately at the end of the day, it's really about having people f- having and helping be a facilitator for people to feel more connected to themselves, more connected to their purpose and passion, more connected to God and, and more, uh, much less fearful and and much much more open and loving and and trusting that mm. as all the great teachers say beckwith etc that life is for them you know we're all here for a reason yes it's all unlimited that any type of fear 
uh, besides like, I don't want to touch that burning stove type of fear mm. is, is just truly like a limiting belief, yes, you know? And we are full of them. <laughs> We're so full of them. Yeah. Stripping away those limiting Stripping beliefs. Stripping away. One yeah. by one yeah. by one. And meditating and going within yeah. and, and praying and asking to be connected to that place of pure love. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that helps. I, and I, I think it is more the stripping away than the adding to, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I think so much of, especially like being born in the West and all the programming that we're given mm -hmm. that sort of reinforces the limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. you know, and then when you just strip them away one by one, you realize you already have what you need. Yeah. I mean, think you know? it's like all these dark clouds in the sky, you yeah. know, if you try to move them out of the way or make them disappear or whatever, it's like, well, look at what's beyond them. There's the, there's the majestic universe and in the right stars. There. It's, it's right, right there. there. It's right there. It's just on the other side. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. It's my pleasure. Enjoyed it. It's awesome. Well, that's the end of the film. Now here's the meaning of life. Thank you, Brigitte. <clears throat> well, it's nothing very special. But try and be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book every now and then, get some walking in, and try and live together in peace and harmony with people of all creeds and nations. And finally, here are some completely gratuitous pictures of penises to annoy the censors and to hopefully spark some sort of controversy, which it seems the only way these days to get the jaded, video sated public off their fucking asses and back in the sodding cinema. Family entertainment? Bollocks. What they want is filth. People doing things to each other with chainsaws, join Tupperware parties. Babysitters being stabbed with knitting needles by gay presidential candidates. Vigilante groups strangling chickens. Armed bands of theatre critics exterminating mutant goats. Where's the fun in pictures? Oh, well, there we are. Here's the theme music. Good night.